Hello, everybody, and welcome to Van City Beats, Eats, and More. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jamal, and I'm joined today by our very special guest, Monique. And we are inside of Monique's studio here at the Beaumont Studios in Vancouver's Mount Pleasant neighborhood. Monique has the ceramic company Mimoko, where we have a few pieces behind us here. They're going to be the backdrop of our interview. <laughs> We're going to be getting to know Monique today as well as being treated to a very special demo later on in the interview where Monique's going to demonstrate how she is producing her latest collection of ceramic pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really, really excited to be here today. Uh, we are located on the ancestral and unceded stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations and we're ever grateful for their care of the land and water so that we can be here today. So we're gonna be talking with Monique, getting to know them, demo as I mentioned, but the reason I'm really excited is because the Beaumont Studios is really close to my heart, and um, when I first started participating and being a part of the space, Monique was here already, and when you walk down the hallway, to go to the washroom or the bar. <laughs> you always walk by Monique's studio and it's just filled with these amazing pieces. So it's been really awesome getting to know you slowly and watch, being able to watch you work and host your workshops and do all of the amazing work that you do here in this space. So thank you so much for welcoming us into your studio. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I'm really stoked. Uh, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Jamal. And thanks, Kezi, who's behind the camera today. Yeah. Shout out, Kezi. Um, Jazzy. No, likewise. It's been, it's been great getting to know you too. Jamal is B-Side Radio, and um, you are just a ball of energy and good yes. spirits every time I meet you. So, uh, yeah, it's been nice having you here too. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's go. This is my yes. studio, and um, yeah, I'm excited to explain and go into a bit of a deep dive about why I'm here and why I do what I do. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so why don't we begin with like the the beginnings? Um, where sure. where did you grow up? Sure. Yeah. Not here. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> not a Vancouverite. I am actually from New Zealand and um, I was born and raised in Auckland. Um, yeah. Many years ago and and moved here in 2010. Um, I come from a huge family. I'm the oldest of six children and we lived on a pretty big property in, in Auckland and just lots of nature and lots of like a big garden around and I, I think that kind of spurred my love of plants and is a huge reason why I am making ceramics predominantly for plants. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I miss my family a lot yeah. and they're tuning in right now so Hello. Hi, hey, hey, Mom. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Did, so were, was it kind of like um, a countryside or rural no, area? No, it was, it was suburban. Okay. For sure. Yeah, but my mom was just great with plants. And yeah, um, yeah I put a huge um, re reason for that, for, for my love of, of plants and nature. Well, Vancouver is a gorgeous city, too. It's, it's similar in a lot of ways. We're so close to nature here. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge pull of coming, coming here and making the big move over in, in 2010. Uh, yeah. Was yeah. were you out playing a lot, like in the garden, yep. out outside? New Zealand is quite different to here in that the kids just run free and wild. N shoes are optional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it was. It's a very safe place to live, and uh, yeah, we were just kind of outside. We we lived indoor outdoor all the time. Well, totally. Yeah. They'd have no land predators, right? Nope. There's there's nothing that can. Yeah. Be, no, so you yeah, can no. just yeah. parents don't have to worry. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> about the kids roaming Not around like here yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah um would you would you consider yourself like uh, tactile from a young age yes i yeah it was in my in my blood from very young age and mum mum would say that all she could hear from when i was with was three years old was like the sound of sellotape ripping off all the time because i was just constantly sticking things to things all the time <laughs> That was at three. <laughs> Fascinated <laughs> with like tape. Scrapbooking and like all yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, and then from, you know, I have early memories 
of digging up clay from behind our garden shed. I Whoa, love uh, doing little little pots and like drying them and the, drying them in the sun. Um, so you were yeah. taking the clay that you dug up and, and forming literally things? Literally in the ground behind our garden wow. shed. Wow. Yeah. So it's something I've always loved doing. And um, yeah, I've been been pretty creative. I took it to, to the next level and went to went to art school while while living there. And um, art, this is after high school and um, studied. What, we did a range of things, but I majored in sculpture, mm. thinking that I wanted to become a furniture designer. Okay. That was kind of the the decision that I'd made during my time there. Yeah. And then the reality strikes of needing to buy woodworking equipment, yeah. needing to find a place that you can house all this equipment, and I came out of university pretty broke, mm -hmm. and so I... Um, basically looked into the yellow pages for a job the anything yellow creative, pages anything creative like I took my fancy and uh, lo and behold got a job at a fireworks company fireworks <laughs> yeah, okay <laughs> they advertised as doing pyrotechnics for special effects TV um, advertising events weddings and I was just I loved that kind of like idea and so I applied for the job and, yeah. and got it yeah and so it was just it was just me and my boss um, and we would design the displays, get the permitting. We, he actually had a school as well that he would teach. Um, and yeah, we kind of trained pyrotechnicians. I became a certified pyrotechnician wow. back in the day. So it's a very colorful past. Yeah, and that was, an, that was um, alongside working at an art gallery community center where I was teaching children uh, like an after school art program and then working in like front desk reception as well. I did, did a lot of jobs at the at the art gallery as yeah. well. So yeah. That's so really cool. That's um, kind of where the first creative venture that I had kind of became born. Mm. I worked with a lot of mediums with these kids, um, but one of them kind of really stood out to me was working with polymer clay. And polymer clay is the stuff that you just bake in the oven. Okay, for okay. 10 minutes. Yeah. And it comes in all the colors. It's super like tactile and easy to work with. And the kids loved it. And I thought, like, I, I like this material. I, I think I can do something with it. Yeah. So I started creating jewelry and I made a business out of it called Little Lamp. You were making jewelry from the polymer clay? Yep. Okay. Yep. Tiny little figurines. My only tool was a needle. Okay. And I would carve these little figurines. They were very punny, I guess. Yeah. Like uh, a giraffe in a scarf or a like an owl with a monocle or like <laughs> nice. they were very quirky. Yes. Lots cute. of very cute, very quirky kind of stuff. Um, and I sold it there at the gallery. I had an Etsy page. Yeah. I had this business for about eight years. And wow. I did really well on Etsy. I bought that to Vancouver as well. Yeah. And did the markets here and you know, did my jewelry from wow. very early on. So that's incredible. <laughs> so I had a I had a, a love for clay from quite quite early on. Yeah, yeah. since you discovered it mm -hmm. in your backyard. Yeah. Sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And then what was the motivation or decision behind moving to Vancouver? So it was my partner, my boyfriend at the time, Jeremy. He really wanted to go. His friend that he had worked with briefly in Australia was here mm. and it was their decision to move to Vancouver for the skiing. It was that was a huge pull mm. and just for a different life. A lot of Kiwis travel the world yeah. after university after working a couple of years. It's called the the OE, the overseas experience. And most it's a, of them, it's a thing. It's in, a thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> New Zealand's a very small place. We yeah. all want to get out and yeah. see the world, you know. The so, OE. Okay. Um, so most most Kiwis do. They go for a year. A lot of them go to London, mm -hmm. not Ontario, but yeah, they're the, the big London. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they do a year or two overseas, get work experience, party, have mm -hmm. a good time, and then come home again. Yeah. Um, we came here and fell in love with the place. Um, it was yeah really special. We moved to Kitsilano, and it's kind of still where I, it's still where mm -hmm. I live. And it's just such a dream. It's like we we are in a bubble here. It's very beautiful. It's it's safe. We cycle. We don't actually own a car. Like we yeah. we cycle everywhere. The skiing is close, the, the nature is close, and like it was just like so many things about it. And we had friends move from New Zealand as well here, and so we had a bit of a cohort of, of expats that, mm -hmm. you know, friends that you collect over time. Um, and yeah, the friends that we met in 2010 when we met are still my 
really close friends. I like my family here. Nice. Now, so. Yeah. That's so it's, it, it helps to have that kind of like nucleus when you move overseas. Yeah. It, it sounds like that definitely helped like make it smoother a little mm. bit, but were there other adjustments that you felt you had to make when you first moved here? Not really. No, if yeah. anything, it was good. I, I got a job serving. Um, I worked at a cafe and then various restaurants. It was just, that was something I've always wanted to do. I yeah. love, I love, I'm a people person. I love, yeah. con you know, being into, around people a lot. So those good kind of like hospitality jobs, I, I gravitated towards and I made a lot of friends that way too. It's a great way to meet people in a mm -hmm. new city. So, uh, yeah, no, I was happy. And yeah, one year turned into more and... Into more! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, we, we eventually got married and yeah, so that was that. Um, and so yeah. you, um, you brought that uh, la little lamp mm -hmm. or, uh, company that you had started. Yeah. Were you doing that here yes. when you first moved here? It was always In only a, a part-time thing. Okay. And, um, I would say I had jobs through the day that yeah. would kind of fuel that, like fund that. Yeah. So. And then <clears throat> how about uh, after that and transitioning to Mimoko? Yeah. How did, how did so you get into I, that? I, I, I just over time, I think after seven years of working with the polymer clay, I just became a little tired with the material personally. Like, um, it just felt like I wanted to maybe like maybe with my designs just grow off a little bit. Mm. I feel like they were just I was not not aligning with the brand anymore, and I just was getting a bit tired of like making those things. So um, yeah, what? I took a break yeah. and I tried everything from watercolor, candle making. Like I just tried dabbled in a lot of extra things, and then nothing really stuck until I uh, met a girl at a at a craft market called Janine. Yeah. And I know this because my best friend's called Janine. And yeah. uh, she was selling pots and plates and mugs and bowls. And I really liked her stuff. And I said, where did you learn that? And she said, oh, well, I just uh, studied briefly at Claytech Studios, which okay. is just here on the seawall, which is super close to the studio here. Oh, you know, the one where, by the, where you, yes. On the, on the Fitz Creek. Like by the Ma restaurant? Mahani and Sons and all that. And the yeah, okay, place. yes, yes. And so I was like, great, I'll go, now. We'll go pop in and see... Uh, See what the dealio was there and and yeah i spoke to alicia who was the technician there at the moment at, at the time and um yeah she's like look they had the wheel throwing classes are full but you can try the hand building class mm. so i was like let's do it let's and what's the try. difference between uh, wheel throwing and hand building so hand building is just using your hands and generally you can make pots uh through the coiling method which is you you roll up a long coil long sausage and you yeah. kind of wrap it around and you can smooth it down you can make pinch pots you yeah. can do slab I just slab yeah. things out of slabs it, it, literally anything mm -hmm. clay is an incredible material it is so adaptive it is so tactile and you can, and, and the artist is just so um, the you can really see the artist's hands and movements in this material it's just it's just it has a thousand faces and that's what I love about it you can work your whole life and still not do everything that you want to do with the material. I love and I love that about it. But it's extremely humbling. Yeah. And you have to follow. You can't rush the process of whatever, whether it's hand building or wheel throwing. And wheel throwing is obviously using the wheel, um, the, pot yeah. the, the the potter's wheel. Um, um, yeah. And you can you can you, you have worked you know 50 years in your profession and still things will crack and things won't turn out the way you thought in the kiln. And um, I, re I, even though it's tough, I, I love that about it too yeah. because it keeps you on your toes and it, it pushes you to, um, yeah, keep just keep getting better and and, and grow. It so. sounds like it's mm -hmm. like a, an honest reflection mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, of, there's no secrets. Yeah, really. there's you can't no. Can't really cover stuff up. A yeah. bit too much. Yeah. Yeah, and it yeah. shows, like you said, how you work with it. Yep. It, mm -hmm. The the style of your building or. Yeah. Which, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So from from early on, I took the hand building class, then transitioned to the wheel once those classes were available, and then once I sat down at the at the chair for the wheel, I was like, "This is me." I I loved it. Yeah. Like so much. Do it you remember such... what it was about it? I'm a I I don't know. I think I'm I'm a, I'm a definitely a perfectionist, and you can see that in my work. I like things to be. So, like, yeah. and the wheel is just an amazing tool to do that. Mm. You, all you do is you're, 
So you're, you're kind of coaxing the clay where to go and the wheel is doing the work for you. So you end up with a naturally perfect circle all the time because that's just physics. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I loved that, that, that push-pull of like the artist versus the wheel. And you really just, at, you're, all you're doing is just, is just coaxing the clay into wherever you want to go. Obviously, there's a lot of learning and it's not easy. It, a lot of people get very frustrated at the start, um, and as, as did I. But I kind of felt like they had like, a, I don't know, there was like, things came, it was, it was a, a slightly easy, easier for me to kind of grasp. Maybe because I'd worked with the, the clay before and yeah. I kind of, you know, it was very different. But yeah. having that tactile like mm -hmm. with your fingers. Um, I loved it like and the um, yeah and people that have done pottery like have I can share this um, opinion as you just you know when you sit down and you just try it it's just something that clicks you know yeah that's very feels cool. good yeah yeah I mean it's it's way easier than or it's way harder than it looks mm -hmm. it, oh, people sure. make it look so effortless easy. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Which is its appeal. Yeah. Yeah. But that's also its appeal too, because it's not easy. And you know, when you do get it after a lot of practice, it's that aha moment. And that is what's so addictive when you're like, I think I've got this. I could, like, I know what I know, what I'm I doing. I got it. Yeah. I, I reached yeah. that, yeah. that yeah. feeling yeah. or and that spot. And once you do that, then you can literally let go and like let your creativity take over, enjoy it. And this is, you know, you talk about flow state and you can just sit at your wheel and hours will pass and you'll be like, oh my gosh, it's like dinner time already. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I loved it about it then. And back then when I, when I did these classes, it, what pottery wasn't really a popular thing. It was a, generally me and the grannies that were doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, honestly. And a lot of yeah. the stuff in, in, the, in, the, in the glaze room was, you know, kind of had a very 70s vibe to it. A lot of brown, shiny glazes, like that really kind of chunky pots and yeah. big mugs but <laughs> chunky fat mugs you yeah know? like i don't know i don't know about these things i just know my style yeah i'm here <laughs> um, to do something different <laughs> yeah I, I, that, and that was totally it i i do definitely see the under the importance of finding your niche doing what what is it that you can't get elsewhere what is it that what what stands you apart mm -hmm. from everybody else and um since art school, I've really, really admired Japanese design and philosophies. Like they, um, the the culture really as a whole has just such um, a meticulous care for what mm -hmm. they do. They have their crafts that span a huge spectrum, and often the <clears throat> the skills passed down from generation to generation. Um, and there's just a real sense of um, striving for perfection mm -hmm. in what they do. Imperfection gets a bad rap, but you know that's this this really this this care in, in in their craft, and the minimal aspect where it's not about the embellishments, it's about the natural materials, celebrating mm -hmm. what's what's true and what's real, um, and I it really I really connected with that and um, show it, that's kind of showed in my art from art school time. Yeah. So um, yeah, I kind of knew I wanted to introduce some of that those ideologies into my work from early on yeah were you introduced to the japanese philosophies behind design in art school i researched them oh, i actually on your own yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i spent especially my fourth year my fourth year dissertation yeah. a lot on japanese have Obviously. you visited Japan? Yes. Okay. I did for the first for time in research purposes? 2018. Research purposes <laughs> yeah. as a business trip. I did. I actually, yeah. um, I, I stayed, um, well, we stayed in multiple places, but I did stay in a tiny town um, 60 kilometers north of Tokyo called Mashiko. Okay. And the, I stayed at a pottery school. They had bedding and, and lodging Whoa. there. And I did a course as well with, with the people there. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing. Yeah. To, they all used it. The, the reason why this town's. <clears throat> A pottery town is the clay that is in the in the in the foothills around yeah. in and around the town is still good mm. and so a lot of potters gravitate towards this this place and it's famous for um, these climbing kiln, kilns which go down the side of a hill and they're all made out of brick and they've just you can load like a village worth of pottery inside there and they're built into the hill into the hill wow. and you fire them with wood so wow. you, you, you load it with wood and you you burn the wood and yeah. so it's a 
it's definitely a, like a three-day process. It's very special. They don't do it very much anymore for economic, I mean, it's like e eco reasons. Mm -hmm. But um, they still light, light them, I think, three times a year, and the, the yeah. community still comes and u utilizes that. But still now, there's a lot of potters that, that still live there and um, are very well known there. And yeah. the, the, gifts, the gift shops along the main road, it's like, I say it's like Disneyland for potters. It is next level amazing. <laughs> I was honestly, yeah. I have my whole phone, like I have just so many photos yeah. of images. I, I took my carry-on luggage is full of ceramics bringing those home. Did yeah, you yeah. buy another luggage as most people probably <laughs> do when they go there? <laughs> I need to save room. I need to save room. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, yeah. Great trip, especially That's just because I've loved, um, I've admired their, their, their practice for so long um, and it was just amazing to, to visit for the first time. Uh, that's incredible that so. you were able to also dig deeper into your discipline mm -hmm. during that trip yep. too and learn yep. from the culture that you were also mm -hmm. intrigued and interested totally. in researching and totally. yeah, that's yeah. amazing. I yeah. went to, um, I traveled to Morocco a few years ago and I went to also like the clay hub of Morocco, which mm. is on the awesome. west coast on the Atlantic Ocean. It's called Safi. Uh -huh. And we watched, yeah, this. they said they get the clay from the earth, they like step on it to smoothen it out or and then let it rest for three days before they start using yes. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. It just shows how hands on and it can it can really be fully um, and uh, the same with in Japan too yeah. like there's these old guys who really you know they do so much work and I'm like I just have an electric kiln I really just I buy my clay from the store and uh, I <laughs> yeah. bring it home in a, in a car yeah. and I use an electric kiln it's just too it seems too easy yes you know? so, uh, yeah 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 the so, hacks yeah, you got totally. the hacks. yeah yeah um, that's so <laughs> when you were starting to make uh, your pottery after mm -hmm. you went to clay tech and stuff were you making mugs and bowls and things or were you getting into pots or, uh, or for, things for plants yep yeah, from I think from I like, definitely did a bit a bunch of mugs and things just yeah. to, to try of course I, I experimented a lot and I used lots of different colored glazes and you know did a lot of stuff there yeah. but um, no from early on I was like I need a niche. I need something that's different. I need I need to do what I you know something that what what will people know me mm -hmm. for? So um, and no, I didn't know at that time I wanted to start Momoko, but yeah. because I love plants, I had so many in my apartment. I was like I, I need planters. So it was yeah. it came out of necessity to be honest at yeah. the start. Um, but and I think um, I just love doing it. And I it was an it was a decision as, as same with my jewelry. To make stuff just for myself wasn't enough. I needed to p find a purpose for my artwork and, and make it for other people. Mm -hmm. Hence, in it, and trying to create a business out of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had no idea at that time I wanted to do it full time. Mm -hmm. It was really just a hobby that um, I was interested in. But yeah, I, the planter idea came relatively soon. And then, yep. so then, yeah, how did Mimoko begin? Um, I, I again, I didn't. I never wanted to go under this my name, like Monique. Skeleton yeah. designs that, that, that I just didn't um, didn't really align with with what I wanted, but um, so I, I knew I wanted a brand name. The Momoko came in a funny kind of situation. I um, was trying to think of a name with a, a Japanese sounding heritage to it, mm -hmm. like that you know it, it, that had my nickname in it, which was Mo. Oh, uh, okay. Me Mo. Okay. Um, and so. We, I was figuring out, I don't know, it took a long time to come up with this name, but I was at an event here in Vancouver. Um, it was a lunch event where um, a ceramic designer, oh, like a, a ceramic artist and a chef came together. But it was an event by Here There. Cool. Events. Were you living in Vancouver I don't when know. they were doing this? They, I haven't heard they, of it, no. they, they combined two artists or two, say, like a chef or yeah, so two they, they were different, yeah. and come together to create an event. So Maggie Boyd was creating these uh, series of bowls, and the chef from the from West Restaurant was c creating this um, this dish that uh, was like a pork ramen dish that for for lunch. So we we ended up by buying tickets. I really like Maggie's stuff, yeah. and we you know I was like, oh, I get to meet Maggie Boyd, and yeah. so my my best friend and I, Janine, um, we sat at the table and the girl next to me was called Momoko and it's a very common Japanese girl's name it yeah. means peach 
it's like a very like feminine name yeah. or girl. Um, and I looked at Janine and I'm like, that's that's it. That's going to be my business name. And so we changed the O to an I so yeah. I could be found online. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's kind of, it was a wow. very simple beginning. At this um, event? Yeah. Meeting this person? And meeting this person. Yeah. And so I, I just really like the, the the sound of it. It's just, it's it's short, it's it's memorable. Um, yes. Yeah, and it has it has no me no meaning really, but yeah. um, just kind of what I wanted to go under is with 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 my ceramics. It all it also conveys the Japanese inspiration. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 I remember. So I remember when I was at the radio once, and my friend Kevin was here visiting from Calgary. I was giving him a tour. I was showing him the space. We walked by. I introduced your studio. And he loved it so much. At the time, you were making um, planters and self-watering planters mm -hmm. and pots. And um, he was in awe of the work. And we came mm -hmm. in, and he asked you to purchase one because he, he wanted to. He was like, can I buy one? I would love to use it to drink my coffee and drink I, tea <laughs> and you you <laughs> responded by saying that oh actually it's not food safe oh yes yeah, so you can't true, true, you can't true. actually drink yeah. out of it <laughs> ceramics is a whole thing glazes is a, is a whole beast into itself yeah. and if you do want to create mugs and, and bowls and things that are for uh, for food or, yeah. or, or or liquids that you you drink from or, or eat with um they the ceramic the glazes really have to be kind of like quite on point and really like mm -hmm. hard and like wet hard wearing mm -hmm. um, my clear glaze really is, is inside all of my things are sealed inside but the outside is left unglazed um, I'll, I'll get a planter I'll show you should I show them for like uh, okay sure yeah, let's just, do it <clears throat> oh. so this is one of my older elder ones from yeah I think I actually made this in clay or in the Claytech studio. Oh wow, this is one of the like, early it's ones. It's really an old, old guy. Wow. But the the clay here on the outside is unglazed. It's I really smooth. like the, yeah. the, the the finish of the porcelain that I use. Mm. Um, and that is that's not the food safe part. So if you were to yeah. put your lips to it, it's it's not like the the bacteria would kind of get into the clay. Okay, yeah. But um, yeah, this is the kind of the general premise of the self watering planters. They each have a wick. That's under and that yes. uh, fed through the hole in the bottom. You fill this section with water, yeah. and the wick sucks the liquid up to the clay, up to the clay, to so the the plant here, yeah. which you, you you pop on top. So yeah, the the self watering planter idea kind of came also within the first year of Mo of mm -hmm. Morocco, and I experimented with all the different shapes and sizes. For for me, that was like where my creativity was. Is like finding the perfect shape. For this section versus this section, and mm. kind of having them, them meet together and combine, yeah, yeah. and having them work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there was many, many shapes that were made. That's um, so cool. And over the years, it really just came down to simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. Like really pare it down. What is what's the overall look? And generally, the the the, the pots that were less busy were more successful. Yeah. Um, what about that texture? The, yeah. The the. Can you explain how yeah. you got that? The that here is a glaze. It's okay, a, it's a it's specific a glaze. It's a or, or crackle glaze. Yeah. That um, I discovered. Well, I I used early on and kind of fell in love with it. Yeah. Um, it's it's a nice way to show the different sections of the design of the in in the pot. Yeah. It's, it's a way to break up the the, the whole kind of like idea. Um, yeah, I, I really, I'm still not over it. I, <laughs> yeah. um, but because it's it's generally it's it's pretty yeah. neutral and it's white, mm -hmm. I could, it, I feel like there's so much more I can do with it right now. So. And it's unique. Mm -hmm. It's it's something I hadn't exactly. really seen. On, yeah, not a on lot pottery. of people use it. Yeah. Especially no one, not not anyone I know really uses it on like a raw clay surface. Mm -hmm. Generally, you would use that glaze over the top of a colorful glaze and mm -hmm. so the color would come through the through the cracks but it would be oh, quite shiny and it's, it's definitely a look but, yeah. yeah it's but, a look uh, mm -hmm. well we are here in the mimoko studio at the beaumont and this is your full-time mm -hmm. thing right mm -hmm. um so when what was the inspiration or decision behind making this your full time and c pursuing a creative business. Yeah, that's a, it's a big it's a big question. It's mm -hmm. one that's close to my heart. Um, 
So uh, after living here a couple of years and, and starting ceramics in 2015, at the Clay Tech Studios. I was still working, I think I was at the time working at a physiotherapy clinic mm -hmm. uh, as a receptionist and loved it. Like it, was a, it was a fun job, but um, doing the ceramics in the weekends and the evenings at the time. And um, yeah, I was here with Jeremy, my, my husband at the time. Mm -hmm. um, then a sequence of events happened and um, he passed away. It was a huge, huge part of my life. And obviously like it just came out of nowhere. He had a heart condition that um, we, we knew about um, and he got quite sick. It was all very quick. It happened six weeks after our, our honeymoon. Mm. Um, we, we came back and he fell sick and he passed away in 36 hours. It was, it was like, yeah, the most tragic part of my life. Um, and when things happen like that to you, it really makes you think about what's important to you and how you want to live your life. And really it, it hits home how fragile life is mm -hmm. and how you don't know that you'll be here tomorrow. You don't know, you, you can't guarantee that. And so if you're not really giving your all to what you really love doing, then what, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. So. It was a huge decision. It's a scary decision, especially to, to become a full-time artist uh, here in a very expensive city. But um, yeah, thanks to my friends and my family who believed I could do it. Um, mm -hmm. That was a huge, yeah, huge turning point. And um, yeah, I kind of put my I put my resignation in at the, at the clinic and looked for a space. And Jude helped me out in a big way here. And. Mm -hmm. I moved into this space and yeah, it was equally like the most hor horrific thing, but also an amazing um, silver lining too, because just now I'm doing what I love doing. Mm -hmm. And um, for that, I'm eternally grateful. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing uh, that yeah. with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, were you, did you feel that your uh, support network really helped you out after as well? Yeah, of course. It's. Uh, it's, it really takes a village with any huge event like this. Um, you can never go through this and, and really truly heal on your own. So, um, mm -hmm. of course, yeah, my, my, like I said, my friends and my family here, and they were all very good friends with him too. So we all, we all lost uh, someone close to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, but Clay as well has been, you know, that get this connection that I, that I have to it and with my work has been incredibly healing as well. It really helped me go through some really tough times um, coming out of that. So yeah, it's nice to be able to focus the energy and, and all these emotions that you can't really put into words mm -hmm. into your art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I was, I mean, I was reading something recently that was saying that like the, the practice is in returning to, to like maybe returning to a craft or a setting or something did you feel like that was strengthened that connection when you did return to making pottery yeah yeah and yeah. working with clay yeah for sure yeah definitely is definitely a connection yeah and yeah. then how how did you uh, begin <laughs> then with Mimoko so again it was uh, this is another really story uh, a, a, a quite an, an unbelievable story. Um, I, I moved in here in 2017 um, in the summer and the plan was just to make it on my own and, and you know as, as any new entrepreneur goes just you know, wait, do what you can and wing it. <laughs> Figure it out as you <laughs> Figure go. Figure it out yeah. and you generally can do that. Yeah. But um, I was incredibly lucky to have um, a very serendipitous moment. I um, got a call from Jeremy's boss. He worked at Hootsuite, which is ironically just a couple of blocks away from mm -hmm. here. Um, and his boss calls me and asks, how are you doing? And how, you know, just, just mm -hmm. checking up on you. And I, I hear you moved into a new studio and just want to come say hey. Uh, oh, and my sister's in town. Um, would, you be ca would, you be, would you be okay if I, I bring her as well? And mm -hmm. I was like, sure. Like, that's, it's, it's an odd request, but yeah. uh, not a problem. Like they, <laughs> like his his workplace were, were amazing. Honestly, through the funeral and mm -hmm. like, they were incredible. They they really helped us out a lot. 
Um, so, and he was a well-respected um, person mm -hmm. of, and working there. So um, anyway, so th um, this guy Alex comes and um, he brings his sister and when they walk down the hall and he introduces her as Janine, I'm like, you're kidding. Whoa. This is the person <laughs> at the market who introduced me to ceramics at the very beginning. And it was his sister. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and she'd been living in Portland, Maine, on the other side of the States for the last two years. She was in town for one week and he decides to bring her to my studio. I, my mind was blowing, their minds were blowing and yeah, that was crazy. They ended up staying for a couple of hours and had long chats and I was still setting up all the equipment in here and Janine was like, you know, helping me out through a lot of stuff, just little advice, advice here and there. Mm -hmm. It was great. And so I was so thankful, you know, to, to have wow. that connection again and to be reunited again and um, just to say thanks as well for introducing me to ceramics. It was huge. But um, it's not where the story ends. She, she emails me two weeks later saying, Monique, it was great to meet you. I really enjoyed our chat and, and you know, I'm glad to, to hear that you're doing well. Um, I've had this revelation. I used to work as an assistant for uh, a, a well-known potter here called Heather Dahl um, back when I lived here in the city. And I had lunch with her on my trip when I was back. And I noticed that she's looking for a new assistant in 2018, which was next year. Would you be keen? I'm like, absolutely. I need to learn as much as I can right now. And so I was like, 100%, let's do it. So I interviewed with Heather and we got on like that. It was just um, instant click. She, um, yeah, it was ama it, like amazing kind of connection there. And so I started there one day a week working for her throughout all of 2018 and then spent four days a week here in my studio building my business, building my collection, building my brand, mm -hmm. and all that too. And so that is a huge, huge um, reason to, where I like a reason for where I am today is thanks to Heather, um, and she's still my mentor now and wow. really good friend now. I we we talk all the time and um, yeah, I, I I for that I'm incredibly grateful that that that, that the stars aligned and um, I, I I see it as Jeremy looking down and help helping me out there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. But the hairs on my <laughs> shins were tingling. <laughs> When you mentioned that, it's, that it's a wild, Janine had come back. It's a wild and, story. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Wow. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> that is amazing. So yeah, from there, it, you every year you build on, on your experience and your work. I reached out to um, various boutique stores around the city, mm -hmm. got into wholesale relatively early on. Um, and I chatted with Heather about everything. Obviously, she, working for her not only like physically and like we're making all the pots and, and helping her out in the studio but we chatted business um a lot there mm -hmm. as well and branding and advertising and marketing everything like it was yeah really really good to have that and to have people in your life that you can chat to those mm -hmm. chit chat with these things about um because i did the markets with my jewelry i've always had kind of creative friends and people in a similar role to me so i, I really like to lean on, on on those people and get in, and say with my 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 bestie janine here we would always chat about the the the, the back end of a creative business and, yeah. and it's so interesting to me i could chat to you all day about about that <laughs> and, and how you put yourself forward how how you brand how you everything yeah, yeah i mean it's, it's the whole package isn't it it is yeah. there i mean there's so many aspects to it and also the the fact that you had heather as a mentor mm. to you know to be able to learn from mm. yeah. and exchange that yeah that information and yeah. that's yeah. yeah that's amazing that's exactly what i needed at yeah. that time yeah yeah for sure and so, <laughs> so we have some pieces behind us here mm -hmm. that are different from the planter you showed us yes and i've witnessed kind of like different you've released different collections throughout mm -hmm. um that have kind of their own energy and style can you tell us a little bit about the evolution of your style sure as, yeah of like Mimoka? i said i think the the, the wheel throw and stuff is def definitely definitely yes. sim simplified over the years um the the shapes have become a little 
uh, more refined. That's really my goal every year is to refine my look and to refine the, the shapes. Proportion is huge for me. Um, to, to get that right, it does. it's not easy. Mm -hmm. it, and it really takes trial and error to understand what good design is. Um, so that's taken a lot of time. Um, the new work mm -hmm. is actually made in a very different way. So enter a new chapter of my life. Yes, um, can you so tell so us about <laughs> how did you develop so this new way? So why did I do this all of yeah. a sudden? Well, um, in 2019, if I get that right year right, I, a little while ago, um, I met Ronnie. And um, he is my fiance now. And yeah, he is really just me in male form. Like, <laughs> that's <laughs> weird to say. <laughs> he, is my, it's, he is my other soulmate. Um, yes. And yeah, we, um, we, we hit it off really, really well from really early on. And ironically, he found me through ceramics as well it was yeah instagram it's the new dating app i don't know if you've heard <laughs> um he he's an architect and um was um involved creatively with um, another potter here in the city they were doing a collaboration creating a lamp together he was mm. doing the electronics and she was creating the 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 ceramic shade and they were hosting an exhibition with a couple of other friends that she had known through the the art scene and uh, i think he had he had followed me Mm -hmm. Like for six months prior, he followed my trip to Japan, like yeah. interested, you know, just people that you chat with online, yeah. as, as you do. But um, with this exhibition that they were hosting, I was going to go with Heather because this, this other potter was in the same studio that Heather was in. Okay. And so that's how I, I knew her. Nice. And um, yeah, we were going to go to opening night. Heather bailed on me last minute and I'm like, oh, do I go? This guy Ronnie's here, and I was like, kind of, I was ready to date again. Like, oh, like maybe we'll go, for, just go rock up and yeah. see, see how it goes. And um, yeah, so I turned up, and uh, I was like, hey, are you Ronnie? And he's like, yes, I am. And four hours later, I left, and <laughs> it was just like, just easy. You know? Yeah, it was. We we got on really well from from really early on. He is creative and has a huge respect for pottery and ceramics, and and just generally design in general mm -hmm. so um yeah there's a lot to talk about there and and yeah it's kind of it was really amazing yeah um we had our first child last year yeah yes so, congratulations yeah. um a huge turning point in my life too i think that's it, you don't really know what it's like to become a parent until you become a parent and how much your life changes and i went into maybe motherhood thinking like oh you know we'll, we'll manage we, we can do things the way we've done before yeah. even though there's this little kid around uh, and i uh, did obviously prepare and plan and i, I realized from early, early on that if i was to create work the way i'd done before on the wheel it was it's, it's really a no-go like mm -hmm. I, my intention was that oscar our son yes his name's oscar um he was going to come into the studio with me yes um i i wanted to to be there with him it was something that i i mean i was and i had the space here and yeah the Belmont was was happy for him to come yes. in so i was like well why not let's do it and you have kind of a that flexibility i have flexibility to have that. and why not and like, we got the yeah the, the cribs right the crib right, right here right there um so, <laughs> so it was a big it was a big decision to say not goodbye but see you later to wheel throwing um mm. I, it was something i felt you know, sad about but i knew that it just wasn't going to be feasible like when you're on the wheel it's really it's it's a process that you, you cannot rush there's it's about two weeks from start to finish with the you know the throwing it actually like the making of the pot on the wheel a lot of people ask me like how long does it take to make a piece and i'm like well three minutes and they're like what but well, actually it's two weeks because yeah. they you know the, the, the time it takes for you to make it on the wheel is tiny and then you've got to wait for it to dry four days and you've got to fire mm -hmm. it in the kiln and no, then you've got to trim it so mm -hmm. trimming is just to clean up the the, the 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 underside of it then you've got to let it dry for another like two or three days for it to become bone dry yeah and then you put it in the kiln for the first time for its bisque fire and you glaze it and you fire it again yeah and then as you can see all my work has a little dot i it's again, this is like a homage to, to, to Japanese work, yeah. especially with the brush painting, how the artist stamps their, their, their family heritage or their signature mm -hmm. on the outside. I loved that. Mm -hmm. And it's a 
So I from early on got my stamp and stamp the outside. And the gold is just like the little touch, this little finish that catches the light wherever you mm. are. And it just brings your eye to the, the logo without being too overpowering. Um, that also took a long time to get to. I had lines, I had slashes, and you know, I all tried all these different things yeah. to kind of make my work recognizable. Yeah. Anyway, so that is a third firing in the kiln. That is a 24 karat gold luster. Wow. Which I paint with a very tiny brush. Over, underneath that is a dollop of clear glaze, clear shiny glaze. And so that clear glaze actually is raised. And so you fire that all in the kiln and the glaze firing. Yeah. And then after that, you, you paint on that, that very expensive gold and then you fired it again for the third time yeah so anyway wow. that process it's a long time it's it's a beautiful process mm -hmm. but you and it's messy too you know and you generally need a, a good day to kind of get into your um get into your your work to get create uniform pieces if you're especially when you're making things for wholesale and you're making 10 at 10 and one item it really makes a big difference to make it at the same time because your your hands just know what to do. You're creating work that's that's uniform. Yes, um, you're in the zone. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and you need to do that. Yeah. Um, and now you imagine doing that with a toddler running around. <laughs> I was like, that's it's just it's not going to happen. Yeah. A for a day for that. Not that he would be running around. He might be in the crib. But yeah. But like the time. Yes. It's the physical time that you need. And also, I I I have had assistance. Um, in the past, I've had three yeah. assistants to help me with like the, the wedging and the glazing and the packing mm -hmm. for packing orders, but they can't make my work for me on the wheel. Yeah. That is me, yeah. and that's my my skill and my craft that I've developed mm -hmm. over the years. So I was like, well, I can't really. Ha how will I? Mm -hmm. How will my business run without me meeting me needing to be there every step of the yes. way? And so. Um, I was like slip casting. This is what I, I really want to do. So slip casting is something I've done with Heather. Okay. When I That's was working when you for first her, learned about she, it. She um, she had her molds made for her by um, a guy called Russell Hackney, who is a master mold maker here in the city, and I did helped her out with her slip casting. It's basically plaster molds. You get of your shape. Uh, you, I'll, I'll show you in a demo soon. Yeah. Um, and. You, you pour your clay in, you wait a certain amount of time for the clay to form a shell around because plaster sucks out the liquid. And then you pour out the excess, you wait a little while and you, you're left with like a very thin shell of ceramic, which can be cleaned up and you know, fired the mm -hmm. next the next day. It's it's so it's a very efficient way of producing ceramics. You're going to get uniform pieces every time. Plus, it now it means that you don't you're not bound to round objects anymore. Yes. You can design whatever you want now. Like that's and for me, I was like, this is what I want to do. I, I I knew I wanted to do it for years, even before Oscar was born. Mm -hmm. I uh, my friends will the test. My medics always been talking about slip casting. So I finally, like we're here, we're doing it. Um, so yeah, he was born, Oscar was born in 2022 and I went back to the studio in 2023 in January. Ronnie was on paternity leave for mm -hmm. extended time, like, like seven months. Nice. Or maybe a little bit longer because we were in New Zealand. Anyway, Oscar was going to come to the studio with me like once Ronnie's paternity leave had finished. Yeah. Um, I think when he was 10 months or something. So I had a chunk of time. I had about six months of studio time where I'm like, okay, I'm going to learn this new craft. Because mm -hmm. like, I had done a little bit with Heather before. I'm like, nah. But I wanted to make my own molds. And that's the big one here. Yeah. And I um, severely underestimated how difficult that would be. Yeah. And how technical it is and how it has to be a certain way otherwise it's just not going to work um yeah i i obviously chatted to 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 mentors like russell and i did a lot of youtubing yeah. and chatted to other people that did it but when you're learning something new there's a lot of things you're going to come across just on your own and i came across them all like it was just <laughs> Every one step thing of the after way. after another thing yeah after another thing after another thing after another thing and it was a uh, it was the most stressful year I've had, I think, in the studio, yeah. especially being a new mom on top of that and uh, very little sleep and lack of sleep mm -hmm. um, was a huge one too. Thanks for Oscar waking up at 2 a.m. Um, <laughs> but um, so, and then even figuring out the design of these pieces, mm -hmm. like I had it just on the shelf behind you there, it's, I had so many designs that were going through my head um, that I was like no no idea yeah. but it was just a very challenging time creatively yeah. for me to be yeah be learn how to be a new mother and learn a new craft at the same time yeah. 
and um, I definitely underestimated how um, how difficult it would be to to do that. Well, yeah. you mentioned that Russell is a master yeah, mold is, maker, yeah, so years of family lineage. <laughs> yeah, so then you choosing to make that for yeah. yourself. Yeah. I mean, it has huge advantages yes. in the end. I, and that's so it's the, worth it. That was the goal. At the, yeah. the long term vision is that I would create these these pieces. Um, and to, to give you a very quick run now with, with slip casting and mold making is that pl you can't just make one mold and, and call it a day because plaster being a natural material has a finite shelf life. Mm. Once you cast with the, with the, the clay inside, yeah. it starts to break down and all the detailing becomes lost. The, it starts to pit. Um, and you're left with very bumpy ceramics. Mm. So generally after about 20 to 30 casts, which is not that much, mm -hmm. you need to replace your mold. And so you need to figure out how you're going to replicate your mold easily so you don't need to make your, your whole master again and then you know make your master mold out of that again. It's, it's, it's technical. I won't get wow. into too, too much this detail, but that, um, it, was, yeah, it was a lot to learn to... Yeah, to figure that. The, the, the slip casting is almost like the easy part. Yeah. Even though that wasn't too, because the, yeah. you've got to figure out a new clay here. And I had assumed since I was throwing with porcelain, yeah. and my slip is porcelain, that the glaze and would react in a very similar way. Mm -hmm. It didn't. Nope, it didn't. Yeah. yeah and, another uh, thing And that learned. was after <laughs> I made 75 liters of it. Yeah. Oh <laughs> my goodness. So uh, that was, it was a lot. Um, there were a lot of tears last year. Um, <laughs> so I formulated yeah. a way to uh, find a happy medium. I was between anyway a porcelain and a stoneware. So sto stoneware is a slightly different, like um, it is a t slightly more toothy appearance. And I, I didn't love it as just on its, on its own. Mm -hmm. It didn't really feel as 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 expensive uh, looking mm -hmm. as porcelain it's porcelain just has a lovely density a beautiful mm -hmm. like color to it it really has like life to it and mm -hmm. I, I, for me i really loved it and it looked great with my my crackle yeah but my crackle glaze sheared off and every mm -hmm. time you touched or knocked it hard it, it would, would fall it would it would crack off or and bring a piece of the clay with it. Oh, so ceramics is, is a real science, really. You have to do a lot of testing to make sure that things are going to be compatible. Yeah. So anyway, I, it, that was a long story too. And then I ended up having a eureka moment where I mixed my clays together. And so right now, my, my the clay that I use is half stoneware and half porcelain. Wow. Which is kind of like a... You don't really do that in, in, in slip casting. It's like no, like, one no one taught you that. No, you figured it out. No, yeah. no, and um, and and yeah. So, it, but it's it's honestly the sweet spot. And I danced a lot when that came out well in the kiln. The glaze was happy with it. Everything kind of worked really, really well. So yeah, Congrats. we kind of got what, there in the end. Great work. <laughs> All that grind. <laughs> Um, this was this was yeah when Oscar was uh, uh, he came in obviously halfway through last year as well yes. so he was in and I was working during nap times like it was it was a lot yeah and I mean people who work here love Oscar love having Oscar he's, around I'm sure he's a pretty popular kid. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, can we yeah do show the people your demo now? absolutely yeah. yeah come on through okay so what are you gonna be you, we you just explained to us the process of slip casting yeah and some of the work that you went through yes so um these as you can see do, i do want to pan on that guy and just this is this is the um this is my crescent vase here it's um the left portion is watertight inside it is fully glazed inside so it is a vase that you can insert um, trailing greens Literally anything um, for and for propagating. I'll show you very quickly here that um, the what I love about um, displaying um, these these uh, ceramics on the wall is that they are all watertight, so you can display fresh foliage. And basically, this is going to just keep living on the wall indefinitely yeah. because they you, you propagate and they grow roots. So yeah. it's, it's hydroponics in 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 some sort of sense. Um, did, and how did you get the waterproof glazing on the inside? So everything is hollow on, uh, with the slip cast. Yeah. You're, you're making these hollow pieces. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So they're, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These, mm -hmm. I mean, your work is beautiful as well as functional. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here are the molds. 
that I've created. This one here is the left portion of the crescent vase that you just saw. Um, and what we'll do, um, maybe I'll see in the front. And you've got to make sure that these, these pins are involved as well so nothing slides around too much. Um, now plaster is inherently absorbent, so as soon as you pour a liquid slip and clay into it, it starts drying out the clay. So what we'll do is close up our form. I do generally wipe it, um, just to kind of like create a nice, make sure it's all nice, nice and clean. Um, as I mentioned, I was a perfectionist before, so <laughs> slip casting is, very much in line with my tendencies like it, um there's it's, it's a very like precise yes. heat, like, refined work clean very yes. clean yes you work with these tiny blades here so yeah but um so you close it up with a strap oh and i'm doing it the wrong way hang on <laughs> as you can see the pouring well is on this side nice And I like to use these ratchet straps. A lot of other slip casters use um, bicycle wheel in inners, um, like inner tubes. But to me, this whole stretching, I don't know, it seems to more difficult. So this keeps it nice and nice and locked in. Nice. Um, I have my big slip tech here. I'm just going to be two seconds. Oh, yeah, for and get sure. some uh, get some clay. <clears throat> Sweet. Yes, to everybody who's just tuning in, we're here with Monique, and she's giving us a demo of the slip casting method that mm -hmm. she developed over the course of last year. Yeah. So this is slip um, in this bucket here. You pour it in nice and slowly. Like I said, the slip casting, once you have all your testing done, is actually the easy part because you, you fill it up. Make sure that there's no... Your bubbles in. You see, you've got to make sure all the bubbles are out. So give it a good little shake, it shake like so. And the pouring well is here because, like I said, the plaster is inherently absorbent, so it will suck in the clay and dry it as it goes. So you'll notice that dropping over time. Yeah. Because the clay is becoming uh, like it's forming its shell on the outside. So I leave that in for 20 minutes. So I have a series of timers, yep. <laughs> which are hilarious because uh, when Oscar's napping, that's when I work still. Like he yeah. still comes in. So this, by the I mean, this the fact I can do this and, and work in little snippets of time that I have mm -hmm. is amazing. So now we we have it. We have the system down. You got it's, it dialed. It's, to... it's really good. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So this is the. Uh, one that I prepared earlier. Uh, it's like <laughs> we got the, the, it's like the cooking show style. Yeah. We show the prep. So um, I poured this ready. just before our interview started. Um, had it in there for 20 minutes. Um, it's got to sit, once you pour out the excess clay after 20 minutes back into the slip tank, this has got to dry for 30 to 45 minutes, mm -hmm. depending on the weather. This is a dumb thing I've discovered too, but when it's winter, it takes a lot longer for the plaster to dry and to form the shell that's, you know, hard, that's, that the clay's hard enough that you can open it up again. Okay. Um, yeah, I was getting lots of times where I was taking out my mold and it was just, the, the slip was just ripping. And I'm like, mm. what's going on? Like, I, you know, I have no mm -hmm. idea, but you just got to leave it in for a little bit longer. So there's a lot of little things like that that you have to like just figure out. Yes. Out. Yeah. <laughs> that you found out so uh, with my rubber rib here I take away you can see what's on the inside here that's the the excess or the, the clay that's hardened and this is like the clay is at a little stage called leather hard now so it's kind of pliable it's somewhat elastic but it's strong enough that it's going to hold together. And so I just clean up the excess around the outside here. And with any luck, it should 
pop right out. Yep. Wow. So now you're left with the pouring well, kind of like the, the outer shape of it. So with your fine point blade, I, with a very steady hand, I'm using the wheel to turn more than my hand to turn. And that takes a little bit of getting used to, like kind of cutting in a very straight line. Mm -hmm. Using a different type of wheel. Uh, yeah, for this. using my band wheel, sorry. Um, okay, now I'm just going to get my... <clears throat> sponge here, and what we do is we clean up the seam line. And slip is actually quite a dream to work with, this formulation of the half porcelain, half um, stoneware. It's very nice. The porcelain alone was quite finicky to work with, which means that when I was cutting through it, a lot of it would sometimes tear and create little cracks, um, which are really difficult to fix if you can fix them at all. So um, it's a lot nicer to work with. And I have this handy circular cone sponge, which uh, I bought in the Netherlands and I don't know where to source these from now. So I, I'm going to use this until it really dies and then somehow find one online. I yeah, struggle with that. <clears throat> um, if anyone knows where we can get a cone shaped sponge please, on a stick. Otherwise I'm just going to make one. <laughs> but you just clean up the little edges here. So this is the back now where you insert the, this is where I'm going to glaze through um, in the inside here. But now for the side, we need to create a hole for the stem for the plant to come through. So a lot of people use, don't use this, but I really bit? like to just use a drill bit by a manual hand turned drill bit. Cool. And so, um, and it means that now I'm free to like put my hole wherever I want. So. Do one. Nice. And, and obviously this helps that you have to wait for the clay to be at a really good stage that it's not going to crack and m m really go nice and gentle. It's still uh, not fully dried enough that, exactly. you can, it's that still, you can go through. Exactly. And then with this handy sponge. We have someone here in the Instagram live saying you can get the sponges on Amazon. I've looked on Amazon. <laughs> You can't get this sponge on Amazon. <laughs> I've tried. That Trust was my first us. port of call. Send me the link. <laughs> uh, especially being this size. You can get like, yeah, other stuff for like, anyway, that doesn't yeah. matter. Um, okay, so now we take it out and it's still really delicate right now. So having this kind of like, closed form shape it's it's not a very common shape for slip casting to make these like kind of sculptures mm. in a way generally you're making like uh you know like a, a shape like that which is a lot easier for it to come in and out so i definitely challenged myself with this collection and yeah. making these quite um, intricate pieces but um yeah we, we we did get there in the end that's so cool <laughs> so, and... Um, and then lastly the final so you can see that's what it looks like on that side here um you can see the seam line, so that's where the the two molds come together. Yeah. That does need to be cleaned up as well. Yeah. And so I just use my sponge really gently just to kind of smooth down that end there. And any slight bump or anything that, you know, that say so sponge line, I use a, um, a rib again or this very squishy rubber rib to really smooth things down because I used to sand um, 
these pieces once it came out of the bisque kiln and that's just before you glaze it but it's just I'm I'm done with the sanding I, I never did it with my my wheel throwing things mm -hmm. it's just too there's too much dust and even though you're wearing the like protection I'm just I just don't want to have it in mm -hmm. my practice anymore. So if I can finish my pieces and have them fully smooth at this stage while it's leather hard, then I'm going to spend an extra five minutes and do mm -hmm. that now. So I skip my step later on. Yeah. So I'm ready to go once it comes out of the kiln for it to be glazed. Yeah. That's amazing. So this now is really, it's the, the, the process of this, like the, 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 the time, sorry, that it takes us to, for this to dry is, is quick. Tomorrow it'll be ready to yeah. put in the kiln. Versus if I was to throw on the wheel, I would have to wait four days before, you know, three to four days before I can trim it. Mm -hmm. And then another three to four days before I can fire it, just yeah. for the drying time. Yeah. Like you can't put a wet piece in the kiln. But since this is so thin and it's so lightweight, um, just dries a lot quicker. So, yeah. That's the piece. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And I mean, so much... Uh, respect for the whole process that you went through to develop and figure out this method and Thank work you. out the whole process to Thank get you. to exactly what you want the product to be <laughs> yeah like yeah. yes commend so, you very much on that thank you so yeah i'm excited for this collection it's still very new i only launched in november last year yep. so i'm about to release my second lineup for the um, for the um for the web shop in the next in this week yeah so things will be available again And the soon. collection's called Nature Finds a Way, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So um, Ronnie actually was like, oh, they kind of look like, you know, these, these sculptural pieces, like, you know, the way a, a seedling, like a flower can find its way into a rock face and then just through the little crack, it somehow breeds life and it can yes. grow in these really challenging or very unlikely environments. Very unlikely. So that was the, the kind of inspiration behind the, the name. Um, yeah, thriving and challenging environments. You can all take that one home. Yes, yeah. well, I mean, so. everything that you've shared with us today has shown that, that, you, yeah. that you're that you able to thrive in challenging <laughs> environments. I don't know, there was a lot of tears last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's what's life with a bit of, uh, without a bit of hardship, huh? For sure, I mean, so, that's what, yeah. I mean, allows our character to grow, I think. Exactly. And yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is where you're at now. Yeah, yeah. And if you're, if you're not pushing yourself, then are you really growing? Are you, mm -hmm. are you really being the best that you can be and doing the best that you can do? So, yeah. I think a lot of people um, don't have that push within themselves, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I really, it's amazing to hear mm -hmm. what you've been through and the, the discipline and motivation that you have to do this for yourself and your business and mm -hmm. your family and yeah, yeah it's amazing thank yeah. yeah thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us to get to know you to yeah. share your story fun. and yeah. for showing us your new method thank you um that's been a treat mimoko.me mm -hmm. is the website. the website that's where all your um your port or your ceramics are available yes yeah and then yep. on instagram at mimoko ceramics you can find monique at all those places mm -hmm. thank you yep. again yeah that was thank awesome you. thank you um this my name is jamal thank you so much for tuning in everyone on the youtube everybody watching after the fact this has been another episode season two of van city beats eats and more <laughs> Peace. <laughs>